Lean Church, I praise God for the opportunity to connect with you all. And I want to continue to emphasize the theme for this, these 40 days of prayer, which is he reigns, he still reigns. And it's interesting that you added the word still in there, because I think that for me, it's a reminder in those moments when I think God is not in control, he still is. And I know that so much has happened in the last um, two years it's interesting that we're walking into 2022 and some of us are still getting over 2019, still trying to figure out what happened between the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020 and figure out where we fit into that. So to know that a whole year has gone by and yet another one is starting, it sometimes makes it feel like things are a little out of control and out of pace, but God still reigns. And somebody ought to say hallelujah to that. And this week, the emphasis, the word that God put placed in my heart um, to my group that's, that's on here, that's live, that's on the chat, right? I want you to light up the chat, make it lit right in this moment. And what is the word that we are focusing on this week? If you know what that word is, just go ahead and, and type it into the chat. The word that we are focusing on this week, I'm already seeing it come in. Some of you are dialed in, you're connected, you're listening, you're, 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 you're letting God work. And I always say this, I, I think sometimes uh, the church thinks that as preachers, we are preaching to them when in reality, God is piercing our hearts as well. And that word participate is not just for you all, it's also for me. And, and it's interesting because as I walk with God, I realize that there are moments in my life where I think I'm not participating and yet I am. My decisions are participation. The things that I do our participation, the way that I respond to God's calling, that is all participation. So if you're connected today, you're in the first step. You're already participating with God in what he wants to do for your life. Before we go into the word this evening, I just want to invite you all to have a word of prayer that the Holy Spirit may guide us who has connected us this evening. Father, I thank you for all the connections that are here this evening. Lord, you've brought us from our different respective places in life, our different situations. And I praise you because right now in this moment, that space where we are, that space where we're connected, wherever it is, if it's in the living room, if it's in the, in the bedroom, laying down in bed, if it's in the office, if it's in the bathroom, wherever we're connected right now, that space has become a holy space because your Holy Spirit is going to speak to our hearts. And Lord, it's, 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 be it's a beautiful thing because it's a reminder that it doesn't matter where we are in life, your spirit can still reach us and you will use others who look like us, who talk like us, who walk like us to reach our hearts. So we praise you. I praise you because you've chosen me as the instrument for your Holy Spirit to speak, Lord. So I ask for nothing less than your spirit, the one that has connected us this evening to speak to our hearts in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So the, the, the last couple sermons were focused on Luke chapter one and Matthew chapter one. I talked about Mary. I talked about Zacharias. I talked about John the Baptist. And, and, and today we're going to talk about Jesus and we're going to look at what participation looks like. The Bible, the title for my sermon this evening is actually, what is your name? What is your name? And I'm seeing names come up in the chat as soon as you guys type I'm seeing it there. And there's a reason why I'm asking what your name is. And we're going to get there. But the Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 23, it says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, which is freedom, and continues in it, and is not forget a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. What's interesting is that this verse is so timely to today. A lot of people try to say the Bible is outdated or the Bible is past its time, or how can you continue to connect? 
to a book that is so old because a lot of books lose their relevance over time. But what the Bible is saying in James chapter one is so relevant today because we live in a society where we're being conditioned to see things and not react to them, to hear things and not pay attention. I don't know how many times you've logged into social media, maybe Instagram or something, and you're scrolling through your timeline and you're seeing other people's lives and you're seeing the things that are going on in the world and things that people are posting and going on in other countries. And you only react to the things that are relevant to you. You might not react to the fact that there's a war across seas and people losing their homes and people being bombarded, you may not react to that because that doesn't really apply to you, but you may react to some sort of violence. Maybe it's police violence. Maybe it's, maybe it's violence with people. Maybe it's whatever is going on within that space that matters to you. And right now is a time where we're being conditioned to see things and not even pay attention. And I don't know if that's somebody who's connected today, but the Bible is letting us know that that same attitude, that same principle, that same style of interpreting things can happen to us even when we read the word of God, even when we read it and we post it, even when we read it and we share it, we might look at it, we might see it, we might say, wow, this is nice, this, this is cool, this is deep, this is some deep knowledge, I want to share this. We may do that and ultimately end up in a space where we don't even apply the word to our own lives. I'm talking to somebody today who's looking at the word of God right now and saying, there is no way that I can participate in such a thing because of my condition. But I want to remind you that as we look today through the word, we're going to find two different types of participants. The first one is found in Luke chapter eight, verse 22. The Bible says in Luke chapter eight, verse 22, one day, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. And I have an issue with the way this verse is written. I have an issue with the way this verse is written because when I look at the Greek, in the Greek, it doesn't say that Jesus was telling them, hey, we need to go across the lake and, and, and they now get into the boat. The Bible actually in the Greek states it as though Jesus was approaching the boat. The, the disciples accompanied him. They got in the boat with him. And then when they were in the boat, he said, it's necessary to go to the other side. And if there's one thing that I talked about yesterday when I was talking about dark spaces, remember how I said that God doesn't always explain everything to you. He doesn't let you know everything that's supposed to happen. And many of us know this story and we know the end of the story. So it's easy for us to look at it and talk about the disciples and talk about their lack of faith and talk about like, why is it that God would take them into a boat and then take them into waters that would almost drown them. And they actually believe that they're going to drown when it was Jesus himself who told them it was necessary to get to the other side. It's easy to look at it from the outside in, but I want you to introduce yourself into the story. I want yourself to introduce yourself into the space where you were asking God for something and you were watching him lead and all of a sudden you thought he went silent. I want you to introduce yourself into the story the way that the disciples did. The Bible says Jesus got into the boat and then he told them, it's necessary to go to the other side. And I want to know if there's anybody connected here today that is willing to have blind faith, meaning you don't know what, ex what to expect on the other side. You don't know what might happen on the other side, but you trust God enough to say, I'd rather place my lots. I'd rather place my bid with Jesus in the boat where he is, even if he's asleep, than being outside of the boat on the shore and staying on the sidelines. I don't know if there's somebody today that's saying, God, you know what? We're going through it and it's, it looks like you're sleeping in my life right now. It looks like you're not saying anything to me that I need to hear right now. It looks like that I'm, I'm in a storm that is gonna destroy me right now, but you're in the boat. You may not be saying anything, but you're there. And because you're there, I'm staying in it. I'm staying in it throughout the whole process because I trust that what you said will happen will take place. Before they ever left the shore, 
Before they left the shore, Jesus already told them what was supposed to happen. He said, we need to get to the other side. So before they ever left, he already gave them the plan. He didn't tell them that in the process of going to the other side, there was going to be a big storm. He didn't tell them that in the process of going to the other side, he was going to take a nap because he was tired. He didn't have to tell them all of that. And some of us are looking for God to give us all the instructions to tell us everything that we need to know step by step for us to even follow him as though God is, is, is an instruction manual from Ikea. And, and it's showing us every, can I be real? And it's showing us in pictures exactly what has to happen. And then it's saying it as well. And it's saying that if you don't use this and you don't use this one part, then it's not going to work because this goes with this. And without this, you can't match that. And some of us are looking for that level of instruction from God when in the Bible, it clearly says that if everything that Jesus did was written, it would not fit. It would not fit. And that's how big our God is. And sometimes we think that participation looks like receiving all the instructions that we need when really participation may be as much as Jesus getting in and saying, follow me and not saying anything else. And so the Bible says, as they sailed, he fell asleep. Verse 23, a squall came down on the lake, a storm came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The boats being swamped, they're in great danger, and the disciples need to go over and wake up Jesus. Are you guys seeing the story here? The disciples are having to go over and wake up Jesus when they're being swamped. The Bible says they're being swamped, and I wonder if at any point you stopped and actually pictured this and said, if the, the disciples are being swamped, then Jesus must be getting wet in the process of that too. He must be getting wet by the water, by this storm, because if they're being swamped and they think they're going to drown, that must mean that there's water getting into the boat. And, and, and as that water is getting into the boat, the disciples are starting to panic, right? And, and, and I don't know if, if we ever stopped and thought for a second that Jesus was part of that whole story. He might have been asleep because he was tired, because he was still human, but he was still part of all of that. He was still there. And I'm sure that Jesus was getting wet in the process too, but he wasn't reacting because he knew before he left that it was necessary to get to the other side. And so we're seeing an aspect of participation in the disciples where they get into the boat, they follow Jesus. Jesus tells them what the mission is. They start off on that mission. And then all of a sudden they're panicking because it seems like God is no longer present and he cannot reign in that moment. And, and I think that this theme fits so perfectly with these verses, because these verses are a reminder that even in the storm, he still reigns, that even in the squall, he still reigns, that even when he seems asleep, he still reigns. And there was no way that the storm that looked like it was going to drown the disciples was going to drown our Savior, because he still reigns at any moment. And as we see in this story, at any moment, the storm would have ended. All it required was Christ who reigns to speak to it. The Bible says in verse 24, the disciples went and woke him saying, master, master, we're going to drown. They started to forget. And the Bible says that Jesus, he steps up now and he says to the wind and the waves to calm down. He rebuked the wind and the raging waters and the storm subsided. All was calm. If there's a moment that all was calm, remember all was calm, all was bright, silent night, it started in that moment. It started right after the storm. And the Bible says that after he calmed the storm, he addressed his disciples and he asked them a question, where is your faith? And so now I realize that the thought of drowning was not just because of the storm. It was because they forgot who was with them in the storm. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think you heard that this evening. The, the issue wasn't the storm. The issue was never the storm. The issue was that they forgot who was with them in the storm. 
They forgot that Jesus was there. They knew he was there to save them, but they forgot about how powerful he was because they were, the, the Bible says that Jesus asked them a question and they didn't even answer it. Jesus asked them a question and they didn't even answer it. What they did was they asked themselves questions like, who is this? He commands the winds and the water and they obey him. They were in fear and amazement. They were in that space. They weren't in the space of faith. They were in the space of fear, but they never left the space of fear. See, that's the thing. When the storm started raging, they went into fear. They went into the space of fear and they never got out. And see, I wonder who's connected today and, and, and started off with faith, went into the space of fear and still hasn't made it out of there. Can I be real this evening? See, because sometimes when we allow fear to set in, it's tough to get out of that space because we start to doubt because fear leads to doubt. And that's what happened to them. Fear led to doubt. And they went and woke up Jesus. At no point was that boat gonna, gonna implode. At no point were they gonna drown because before they left, Jesus told them where they were going. And see, I don't know if you're letting fear replace your faith. But that's where Jesus brought them to. He asked them the question, where is your faith? And I see, I see my faithful people, they're lighting up the chat right now. They're saying, God, give me faith. This, this is what I need. I need faith. I need faith for moments like these. And it is true. But sometimes the storms seem so big that they make us think that God stops raining. If there's anything I want you to take away from this evening is do not forget that even when the storm looks like it's going to destroy you, he still reigns. Now, the interesting thing is, that you can still participate with God even if you're participating from a space of fear. Did anybody catch that? You can still participate with God even if you're participating from a space of fear. You might say, Pastor, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's no way that fear is part of my walk with God. Listen. The disciples, in their fear, woke up Jesus. Jesus wakes up, calms the storm, and then he asks the disciples, where's your faith? Right? And the Bible says that they stayed in fear and amazement. In verse 25, it says, in fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. And here's a thought, even in fear, stay in the boat. Even if all you have is fear, even if the only reason why you're joined tonight is, is because you're afraid of where this world is going. Even if the only reason why you came to Jesus is because you're afraid of this situation. Listen, even in fear, stay in the boat because Jesus is there. And I know that there are sermons that talk about Peter when he walked on water and all that stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. Because when Peter walked on water and he was afraid, listen, Jesus was on the water. The point is that no matter if you're coming in faith or you're coming in fear, stay close to God. Because at some point, you're going to see that God reigns. And at some point, your fear will move to faith. Your fear will graduate from the basic space of fear and move into faith. I'm talking to somebody who's connected today, who's worried about their life, who's worried about how things are happening in their life, who's worried about their bank account, who's worried about their marriage, who's worried about their kids, and they're afraid of how things are going to turn out. But guess what? You're in the right space because you can still participate with God, even if it's from a space of fear. I'm going to preach tonight. I feel like preach. I feel like I'm in church tonight. Even if you're from a space of fear, you can still grow into faith. So that's one way to participate. It doesn't mean that you're participating out of faith all the time. There are moments where you will have doubts. There are moments where you will have questions. There are moments where the storm will overshadow the God that you serve. But if you just peek through the clouds for a moment, you will see that Christ is still there. And at any moment, he can speak to those wind and waves and he can calm them. 
I'm talking to somebody today. There's two forms of participation. That's the first one. And I'm running out of time tonight. I don't know if I'm going to have to pick this up tomorrow, but I can, can I preach a little longer? Can I preach a little longer? Is that okay? I'm going to preach a little longer. Here we go. The mission was to get to the other side because there was something going on in the other side that needed to get to Jesus, right? The, the, the disciples participated with Jesus because Jesus told them, let's get in the boat. We need to cross to the other side, right? He walks, he walks them in. And I, I love this picture in my mind because I don't picture Jesus telling the disciples, get in the boat with me. I just picture him walking towards it, getting in, them following him, and then him saying, let's go to the other side. They go through this whole experience. But the Bible says, as soon as they arrive on the other side, verse 27, when Jesus stepped ashore, meaning he just got out of the boat, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus? Son of the most high God, I beg you, don't torture me. And we're listening to this prayer. And this prayer is actually coming from demons that are within the man saying, Jesus, stop torturing us because we found this space to dwell. And now you're here. But the truth is, there was a man beneath the, all those demons, beneath all those things that were within him. There was a man that went charging towards Jesus as soon as he stepped ashore. He went charging towards Jesus as soon as he saw him because he knew that even if he didn't say the right things in that moment, salvation and freedom was found in that man who stepped on the shore. And Jesus knew that he needed to get to that shore because there was a man who was demon possessed who needed to get to him. I don't know if somebody made you think for a second that you have to find your way to God when in reality, God will find his way to you. And it doesn't matter the condition that you're in, he will find his way to you and he will arrive where you are in that space, however you are, in whatever condition you're in. Some of us say, I can't step in church. See, th this is the time of year when a lot of people who don't go to church will go to church. They'll go for the Christmas concert. They'll go for the Christmas sermon. They'll show up. But I'm, but I'm preaching this early. I'm preaching this earlier for my, for my Christians who are still in the fight, who are still in the battle. See, th th there's some people who are going to show up. And there's people who, after they show up for that, they don't go back because they think for themselves, there is no way that I'm worthy to be in that space. There's no way that I'm worthy to be in that place. But I want to remind you about a man who ran towards Jesus and was so demon possessed that in his cry to Jesus, he was saying, what do you want with me? And I don't know if you've ever prayed that prayer before. You need to be in a very desperate position to pray that prayer. But if you've ever been in a desperate position, you ought to shout and praise God right in this moment. Because even in those prayers of desperation, God still listens. And the Bible says that in that moment, that man falls before Jesus and, and, and he's about to start. He's already participating now in what is the, his redemption story. The Bible says that Jesus starts to speak to the man, right, for these demons to leave that man. And the Bible says that the demons left him. They not only left him, and I'm, and I'm moving through the story because of time, but there's a, there, there is a story, there is a thought in there about participation that I learned. And it is in that story of the demon-possessed man that participation is not about self-worth. Participation with God is not about your self-worth. It's not about the value you place on yourself. And right now, we're in a day and age where so many people are trying to show you how to raise your price, how to raise your worth. But some of those people that are trying to tell you how to raise your, raise your worth have a platform that you probably will never have. And so you're still looking at those individuals from a pedestal. But Jesus is saying to you that participating with him is not about what, how you see yourself. It's about how God sees you. At the end of the story of this demon-possessed man, the Bible says that he was sitting 
at Jesus' feet. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed. Jesus knew this before he even got in the boat and crossed over how this man could look, a man who lived amongst the tombs, a man who couldn't be held with chains or shackles because he would break them, a man who scared a society so much that they got so used to seeing him in his demon possession that they weren't ready to see him changed. Somebody's listening to me tonight. The people around him were more scared of Jesus because he changed what they were used to seeing in that man. And I like to believe, and this is a theory that I, that I, that I, that I think, I like to believe that when these people asked Jesus to leave, they were asking him to leave for, because they were afraid if God did that with this man, just imagine what he could do with us. And so many of us focus, I, sometimes I, I let the swines and, and the pigs and the pigs running off the cliffs become my, my, my focus in this part. But, but the Holy Spirit was pointing me towards something else. And it was helping me realize that, you, that these people were afraid of Jesus because of what Jesus did through that man and what he could do through their lives. And they weren't ready for it. They weren't ready to receive that. And so they asked Jesus to leave. The Bible says they asked Jesus to leave. And there was so much more that Jesus could have done in that town. But he did it because they were afraid of him. And you might be saying, Pastor, are you sure that it was, it, it, it was, it was, that they were afraid of Jesus? Yes, I'm sure. Because they were so used to seeing this demon-possessed man as a demon-possessed man that nobody bothered to even figure out what his name was. You guys follow me? Where in Luke chapter 8 does it say what the name of that demon-possessed man was? At which, point, at which point? The Bible says that when Jesus asked him, what is your name? He responded, legion, for we are many. So he never even responded with his own name. Luke never took the time to figure out what's your name. Even after Jesus did the miracle, he didn't take the time to ask, what is your name? And because now this person was sitting different, changed. But the thing is, many times when people get used to seeing you in a certain space, they're not ready to see a different version of you. And you go through life saying, I'm going to reintroduce myself over and over to these people. And I'm going to show them that I'm changed and I'm this and I'm that. I want to invite you to stop trying to introduce yourself to people who aren't ready to receive the changed version of you. Just give it up and continue to live in your purpose. The Bible says that this man did not want to stay where he was. He was like, Jesus, take me with you. There's nothing for me here. And now I learned something else of our participation as from, from the story of this man. First of all, participation is not about his self-worth. And second of all, participation is about the space that you're in. Many of us think that if we want to serve God, we have to go somewhere to serve God. We have to, we have to travel or we have to go, you know, do some missionary work or go outside of the area where we live in. When God is saying participation starts with your home, what did he tell this man as soon as he took him out of that space, as soon as he took those demons out of him, what did he say? He said, go back to your home and tell them. Start with your home. You might be looking to hit all these other people and saying, hey, I need, I need to get you on and I need to bring you to church and all this stuff and people at your job and people. But God is saying, start with your home. And that was the message for me. That's what God was telling me. Participation starts exactly where you are. And you can start in fear. Because if you start in fear, you will be moved to faith and you can start all messed up and you can still be changed because here are two versions. One of them is a group of men who follow Jesus and are in fear of losing their lives. And another one is a man that's so desperate for Jesus that he's not willing to go on another day without the Savior. And I ask you today, how are you going to participate? What is your story going to look like? What is your name? See, the, the reason why I chose the title, What Is Your Name, is because every name comes with the story. 
if I say a name like Martin Luther King, automatically your mind's going to start running. And, and, and that name is going to be associated with some story that you know about him. And I want to ask you today, what is your name? When you say your own name, when you look at yourself in the mirror of God's law, what story runs through your mind? What is the story that you want to leave behind for those who, who don't know you or maybe hear about you one day? What does that story look like? I'll tell you, there was two stories here tonight. One of them was about disciples who were in fear but stayed in the boat. They stayed with Jesus. And when they stayed with Jesus, they made it to the other side and understood that even the wind and the waves obey the God who is in there with them. And then there's the story of a man who was demon possessed, who had the whole town afraid of him. And yet when he ran to Jesus in desperation, Jesus changed his life. My question to you today is, are you ready to participate with God, even if it's from a space of fear, even if it's from a space of possession, even if it's from a space where you're not at your best? Are you willing to say, God, I know you still reign. I'm drowning in this storm, but I'm not getting out of this boat because you're in it. Or God, I'm coming to you and, and, and a part of me wants to push you away because there's so many things within me that want you, oh, that, that cannot stand being in your presence. But I know I need to be in your presence because in your presence is life. In your presence is change. Do you want to participate today? My God, I praise you for this evening. I praise you because, Lord, you were in the boat the whole time. And, Lord, in this, in this sermon, we learn that even from a space of fear, we can be taken to faith. Lord, in this sermon, we learn that even when we don't see our own self-worth, you see our value even before we see it. And you see a version of us that many times we can't even envision. We can't even see it. But you do see it. And I praise you because I only need you to see it tonight. We only need you to see it. Because if you see it, you will take us there. You will take us into that space. And some of us are walking into rooms and feeling unworthy to be in that room. Some of us are walking into spaces at work and thinking, I'm not capable of doing this. And the whole time you open that door for us to be there to show us what you see in us. And so, Lord, I praise you because today you're calling us to participate. Today you're calling us to participate, even if it's from a space of fear. And, and that fear may be of not knowing. That fear may be of the unknown. That fear may be if I give my life to Christ, what, what happens next? I don't know what's going to happen next. I have everything all, all, all scheduled out in my life and, and giving my life to him may, may mean that I give up my schedule. Lord, but I ask that for those who are in that space, may they remember the prayer of David where he said, you, what, the prayer of Jesus, when Jesus said that when, when the disciples said, teach us to pray, he said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, tonight we choose your will. Tonight we choose your will for our lives. Tonight we want to participate in that, Father. And it doesn't matter the condition that we're coming before you. We trust that as long as you're in the boat, we're staying in it. Even if it feels like we're drowning, we're staying in it. We're going to go through it with you. We praise you, Father, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit that will continue with us throughout the rest of this week. In Jesus' name.